Welcome to topic five of Following Jesus. My name is Jonathan Cheka, and today we are talking about the church. And here's the most important thing that I want you to get from today's lesson. You don't go to church, you are the church. We'll unpack that a little bit more, but essentially what it means is that church is not a building that we go to. It's not some distant concept that we can get away from as believers. We are the church. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are the bride of Christ, the church. Let's take a look at the early church in the New Testament. The first thing that I want you to know is that the church, Christianity, is not something that just started out of nowhere without any beginning whatsoever. In the early days of Christianity, it was considered a sect of Judaism. Jesus is the Messiah that was testified about all throughout the Old Testament. So the church is not something that just started out of nowhere. It has roots in Judaism. In Acts 2, we see the beginning of the church. At the day of Pentecost, there were about 120 people in an upper room praying for the Holy Spirit to come and give them the power to go out and be the salt of the earth and the light in their communities. And then Jesus did pour out the Holy Spirit over his believers, and they went out and began the work of the church in their communities. And if we look at ancient history, we can learn a little bit more about how the early church functioned and lessons that we can take from it. One of those is about enduring through persecution. The early church was very heavily persecuted by the Roman Empire. Listen to this quote from Tacitus, who was a Roman historian. Besides being put to death, they, Christians, were made to serve as objects of amusement. They were clothed in the hides of beasts and torn to death by dogs. Others were crucified. Others set on fire to serve to illuminate the night when daylight faded away. So what we see here is that Christianity was not popular when it began. If you were to say that you were a follower of Jesus, you had to be very dedicated to that idea because you may lose your life for it. So today, when we face ridicule over our ideas, do we shy away from that? Do we think, oh no, this is too hard. I don't wanna lose my social status or risk any of my property. Or do we, like the early church, lean into the Holy Spirit and the strength that he provides so that we can endure through even the toughest persecution? Something else that I want you to know about the church is that change in the world should come through the church. Many of the universities and the hospitals that we have even today were begun by believers who saw something in the world that was not as it should be and wanted to make it right. So today, we should be looking at our communities and thinking to ourselves, how can I be the light of Christ in my community? So here in a minute, one of our pastors is gonna come on and talk a little bit more about what it means to be the church. And then we'll come back and talk about what it looks like being the church here at The Experience. So welcome to Following Jesus, and I'm excited to be speaking to you about church and community. But before we kind of get into those two topics, I want to give you some foundational ideas and basically two foundational ideas. First, God has always desired to dwell among a people that bear his name. We see that early on as he creates the garden and then he places Adam and Eve in there. And the Bible says he would come fellowship with them in the cool of the day. And so God wanted to dwell with Adam and Eve and wanted to be with them. And we know they sinned and they were cast out of his presence. But then with Moses and the deliverance of the people from bondage to Egypt, we see that Moses is told by God to build a tabernacle and in that tabernacle is an ark. And that ark was symbolic of the presence of God and the tabernacle was able to move with the people of Israel. And as they moved, when they would set up camp, the tabernacle and the ark would stay right in the center of camp so that any Israelite, when he or she walked out of their tent, they could see the presence of God with the pillar of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day. God wanted to be with his people. And then from the tabernacle, he moves to the temple and the ark is placed in the temple. And as Solomon dedicates that temple, the presence of God comes. And so now God is among his people in the promised land. But then with the coming of Jesus, Jesus, the Bible says, is God with us, Emmanuel. And so we had him, but yet he was limited to time and space as he was in a human body. 
But he promised that when he left, he would send the Holy Spirit, the counselor who would be with all of us. And on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God falls down on the people. The Holy Spirit enters into every believer. And now we are the temple of God. And now God dwells with us. And then there's coming a day when at the end of time, when Jesus comes again, when we receive resurrection bodies, Revelation teaches us that the new Jerusalem will come down from heaven and that God will once again dwell with his people. And so we as the body of Christ, we are the dwelling of God. God dwells with us. But that second foundational principle is also found in creation. When God created in six days everything that had happened, at the end, after he had created Adam, he said this, it's not good for man to be alone. It was the only thing that God said was not good. And so God created from Adam, Eve, a woman to be his helpmate. And so now where Adam was alone, now he had one that was like him, but different, one that could complete him and could rule with him over all the things that God had given them to do. Now, some people wonder about that and they think, well, why did God even create Adam and Eve? Some people erroneously think that God was lonely. But what the Bible teaches us is that within the Trinity, one God, there are three eternal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who have dwelled for eternity in perfect relationship and perfect love. And so we who are created in that image, although we're not a Trinity, we are created for relationships. And so God is determined that we need each other. So you may be asking, okay, I know what church is. I know that God wants me to be a part of a body. He wants to dwell with me, but what's in it for me? And that's a great question. It's okay to ask that question. So what is in it for you? Well, first, you're never alone. The body of Christ is meant to be God's body. That's why we call it the body of Christ. Jesus is the head, we are the body. And so when we're together, even when I may be a single adult or I may be widowed or I may have my children who've moved away, but I still have a body where I can share life together with people. We need that. But sometimes we need to be poured into. We need people who will come and put an arm around us, who will pray with us, who will share the burdens with us. We need that as well. Now, when we're in worship, you don't get to ask questions about the sermon, but when we're in life group, we can open up God's word together we can study God's word together. We can ask questions. We can sharpen one another and we can grow together in our knowledge of God's word. So what's in it for you? You're never alone. You get to use your gifts. You get to be poured into when you need it and you get to open God's word and spend time in it together. So I hope maybe these thoughts will help you see the importance of both church and community. So at the experience, what does it mean to be part of the church? Well, there are three different things that we consider being part of the church. The first is giving financially. You can make the argument that the New Testament doesn't require exactly tithing on everything that you receive, but what you cannot argue is that the New Testament discourages giving financially to the mission of God. So whatever that looks like for you to be contributing to the mission of God, I encourage you strongly to do that. Next, we want you serving somewhere. That doesn't have to be somewhere in the church, but in with one of the nonprofits that we partner with, somewhere else in your community. We should be the salt of the earth and the light to our communities. So we should be serving them in some way. And then finally, we want you to be involved in a small group of some sort. It's easy to get lost in a church that's much smaller than ours is, but in order for you to really grow in relationship, not only with Christ, but also with others, you have to find some sort of intentional time during the week that you can be with other believers and talk about godly things and share your life with them. So to really be a part of this community, you should be giving, serving, and attending some sort of small group. You don't have to be doing all three of these things all the time at every point in your life or you're lost forever. But when you do these three things, I think you'll find that your walk with Christ is much stronger than if you weren't.